Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results with your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is Ozan Pamir. Ozan is the chief financial officer of 180 Life Sciences, a biotechnology company that is focused on inflammatory conditions. Ozan has played a key role in the formation of 180 Life Sciences as he oversaw the merger of three companies and three research programs in 2019, which laid the foundation for the company's successful listing on NASDAQ. He has managed both the private and public financing rounds for the company during his tenure. He has also acted as CFO and board member to two early stage biotech companies, NOC Life Sciences and Unify Pharmaceuticals both preclinical companies focused on autoimmune diseases. Prior to his experience as a CFO, Ozan had a career in investment banking. Throughout his career, he has specialized in helping companies in defining their corporate strategy and executing corporate transactions such as M&As and IPOs. Ozan was previously VP of investment banking at a leading Canadian independent investment bank where he co-founded the Origination Department, which focused on small and mid-cap financing and advisory mandates. In this role, he advised private and public companies on M&A deals and was the lead banker on more than 30 financings, raising approximately $400 million for various life sciences, technology, and diversified companies, in addition to advising on M&A deals worth over $700 million. Ozan holds an economics and finance degree from McGill University and is a CFA charter holder. Ozan, thank you very much for joining me on today's episode of CFO Weekly. Thank you for having me, Megan. I'm excited to be here and talking to you. Yeah, today we're going to be discussing the role of CFO and looking at the unique challenges of the role within the biotech industry. And I'm really looking forward to learning more about this. So let's get started. It sounds great. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing any insight again with your listeners. All right. Well, let's start with you as always. So you started out in investment banking before moving into CFO leadership roles in the biotech industry. So can you tell us more about your career path and the key experiences that have helped shape your approach to finance leadership? Yeah, I would love to talk a bit about my career path and how I got to my current role as the CFO of a public company. And before I do that, I think it's important to take a step back and outline the beginning of my journey to get a clear picture of what shaped the trajectory of my life. And I'm going to go really far back. And, you know, I was born and raised in Turkey. I moved to Canada to study at McGill University, which is one of the top universities in that country. I studied economics, finance, and political economy. And in order to do so, I left my family, my friends, and my connections behind. And when my career journey began, since I was starting from scratch when it came to connections, frankly, I did not have the easiest time landing my first investment banking job. So I started working on my CFA designation right away. I even missed my graduation ceremony because of it. I moved to Toronto. I joined a boutique investment banking firm where I stayed for about six to seven months. And after that experience, I moved on to a really fast growing boutique investment bank called Echelon Partners as a second year analyst. It was so fast growing, in fact, that when I joined the firm, we were about 25 people. And by the time I left the company at the end of 2018, it had grown to more than 300 people in the approximately five years I was there. And this was a very unique opportunity where my managing directors involved me in their deals very, very early on. And I built great relationships with everyone, including the CEO and the president of the firm, who later on also involved me in some of their own acquisitions for the bank itself. So it was a truly a great, great and unique experience, but it wasn't you know all that easy. At the time, everyone I knew was targeting to work at Bulge Brackets and other larger investment banks. And I definitely felt a little bit like the odd one out working at a smaller firm. Then I still joke around with my friends who work at Bulge, worked at Bulge Brackets and about how time consuming it was to align all these logos on pitch decks. And my side of the story was a little bit different. While we were all focused on aligning logos on pitch decks, I was also getting very heavily involved in deals at very early stages of my career. And in fact, one of my managing directors who first became my mentor and now a good friend, 
even made me point person on some of his smaller deals to give me hands-on experience. And, and I was only 23 years old and I'm forever grateful for that experience. It was invaluable in the beginning of my career. And it really truly shaped my approach to finance leadership. Later on at that firm at Echelon Partners, I was quickly promoted through the ranks and ended up as VP and the staffer. I went on to build the entire analyst associate pool. I hired all the analysts and associates by the time I left and who, you know, they all ended up becoming very successful. As VP, I partnered with one of the top equity salespeople we had at the desk. And together we created what we call the origination department. And there we focused on small to mid cap financings and MA deals. And smaller deals can usually be harder to complete as they are riskier and require a lot more due diligence and a lot more legwork to get done. But it's exciting nevertheless, and it turned out to be a great endeavor. So by that time, I was running my own deals, managing three to four analysts. I had my own associate. I had built up the investment banking bullpen. I was still working with the managing directors on their files and supporting them. And by the end of my banking career, I was the lead banker on over 30 financings and raised over 400 million for a variety of companies. And I was mostly focused on lifelines to the tech industries. All in all, I'd say I had a very unique experience than what you may hear, hear elsewhere. I actually have very fond memories of my IB days, even if I was pulling in 100, 120 hours a week, because I had the great fortune of choosing who I worked with. You know, I was able to hire good, very hardworking people. I'm still friends with them. And I, I formed a very effective team and that really stuck with me. And, you know, when I look back, I can see how my managers took a huge chance on me. You know, at that very early, early time in my career, I, I was given all these big responsibilities and I wanted to pay that forward. So I took chances on my analysts and associates and paid off every single time. And what I mean by that is that it made me truly believe that if someone has the ability to gain new skills and if you can mold someone and they're hungry for learning, hungry to gain new skills, it will pay off to take a chance on that person versus hiring someone who may have a better pedigree, but isn't necessarily, doesn't have the same decided to drive as the, the other person. You know, I worked really, really hard during my investment banking years and took on extra work and I was hungry for more and wanted more deal experience. And all of that, I think I had one goal in mind, and that was the goal of preparing myself for a future opportunity. And whatever that may be and for me, that ended up in me becoming a CFO. And when that opportunity presented itself, I was very confident in my abilities and confident in myself that I could take on the huge role that I have today. So fast forward to 2018, I started working with the founders of One Eight Life Sciences, when I got there, I had to do exactly what I did at Echelon all over again. Just like I built an effective and high-performing team at Echelon, I had to do that one in life sciences. You know, nevertheless, it was a very challenging transition to go from investment banking to becoming a CFO on the corporate side. You know, now I was really rolling up my sleeves for one company versus working with companies on a transactional basis. I had a very front and center role on a private merger we completed back in 2019. Uh, we merged three companies together and moved the company from Canada to the US. I hired an entire accounting team in the US and the UK. We took the company through its private financing rounds and eventually took the company public on NASDAQ in 2020. And I've been the public company CFO since um, November 2020. After I joined 180 Life Sciences, the main founder we have is from Mark Feldman, who is you know, credited for discovering the anti tnf drug class, has also involved me in some of his other ventures as the CFO of those companies. So I helped him set up those companies, um, establishing kind of infrastructure, take them through their first audits, you know, make introductions to the street, raise seed funding for those companies. And you know, however, once 180 Life Science has been public, it took up most of my time and I had to give up those roles. So these are you know, some of the highlights of my career that approach shaped my approach to uh, finance leadership. Yeah, what an amazing career you've had to date. Can you talk to us a Thank little you. bit about 180 Life Sciences and the work that they're doing? We are a biotech company that's focused on inflammatory conditions. We have three programs, each addressing different inflammatory diseases. The first is the anti tnf platform, um, which houses our main indication uh, for disease called leukotrienes disease. 
This is a condition where a nodule form, forms in the palm of the hand and it starts contracting your fingers together slowly. It's also referred to as fibrosis of the hand. Most people have never heard of this disease, but it's so prevalent. I have not heard of this disease until I met one in life sciences either. It affects a shocking 5% of the population of the U.S. in a year. It's a debilitating disease, and you can imagine how terrible it would be if this, you know, you get this fibrotic tissue in the palm of your hand and you can no longer type on your phone or you can no longer button your clothes or, you know, you can't lift weights when you're working out because you can no longer hold the weights. So we did a phase 2B clinical trial on this with some promising results, and there's currently no other available treatments in the market for early stage disease. We also have another clinical trial we're looking to launch soon uh, in a condition called post-operative delirium. It's a condition where many of us may have experienced with a loved one. When an elderly patient goes through an intense surgical procedure, such as hip replacement or cabbage procedure, they sometimes come out of it not fully totally mentally there, and, and it's really kind of awful to see. Initially, everyone thought that this was caused by anesthesia. However, based on our research, we found out that the body produces TNF proteins during intense surgery, and the anti-TNF therapy we have may be used to prevent this awful condition. We have a second platform that is focused on synthetic cannabinoid analogs, uh, where we will look at utilizing the anti-inflammatory properties of unique CBD compounds. We're about to launch a study on this to test the viability of CBD in a unique patented pill form, which we think may be significantly more bioavailable than the current plant-based CBD that's currently on the market. Within the CBD platform, we're going to look at pain, inflammation, and weight loss or obesity. We have some other preclinical stage indications that are robust pipeline. Um, we don't need to get into that now, but I also you know, want to highlight some of the unique characteristics of our company so the listeners can get a better understanding of who we are. So first is, I think I may have mentioned earlier, one of our founders, and first is our founders and our leadership team. And one of our founders is the scientist who discovered the anti of therapy. So this is a drug class that is the largest in the world that makes about $40 billion a year. And it has some blockbuster drugs you may have heard, like Remicade and Humira. But this kind of expertise in-house, it gives us a, a very good competitive advantage. The second one is that the clinical trials under our anti-TNF platform have been primarily funded by grants to date. This has created a very cash-efficient organization. And that's, uh, that's one of your life sciences in a nutshell. Well, thank you for that. It sounds like you guys are doing some very important work. So what is it that you specifically enjoy about working within the biotech industry? That's a good question. What I have always loved about the biotech industry is that I always love to surround myself with people who are smarter than me. And when you're dealing with scientists who, who have incredible pedigrees and, and they're trying to bring very helpful therapies to market for you know unmet medical needs and being, being a part of that and being surrounded by people with such drive has been the main motivator for me. Yeah, I can imagine there's quite a bit of brain power at 180 Life Sciences. Yeah. So as CFO, are there challenges that you feel are specific to the biotech industry? Yeah, there's, there's definitely a few. One challenge that we're facing is that there are more biotech companies than ever in the market. There has been a flood of biotech companies in the last 10 years, perhaps. And we are all competing to garner the attention of the same investors. This has created an incredibly competitive fundraising landscape, particularly for small cap companies. And as a small cap company, as is typical for small cap biotech companies, we are pre-revenue and dependent on outside capital. So to many of this challenge, as the CFO, I have to actively explore diverse funding sources, even ranging from traditional equity financing to grants to strategic partnerships and, and tax credits. The second unique challenge we face is that the whole industry is subject to a very long and difficult path to getting a drug commercialized. And it's astonishing how long it is between all of the clinical trials that a company needs to run and it getting uh, regulatory approvals in different markets, it can take over 10 years for a drug to go from phase one to commercialization. 
there is no other industry that I know of which has to face this kind of dynamic of being free revenue and dependent on outside capital for that long. And you know, 10 plus years is a very, very long cycle. You must be a very good storyteller. So when you started at 180 Life Sciences, how did you immerse yourself in the business to like really get in a feeling for what the story was? That's a, that's a good question because I, I I think it's very important to immerse yourself in the business that you're in. First thing that I did was I asked the, the leadership team to to present to me the way they would present to investors, and and in, in the, when you do that, you kind of have a very, get a, get a very good understanding of how the story is being told and what can be improved. And coming from an investment banking background. All I did was due diligence on companies and seeing where the gaps of the story were, seeing what can be improved and seeing what works and put that in a cohesive package for anyone outside looking in could understand. So doing that kind of due diligence, just you got to get people to repeat the information to you as many times as you possibly can to get it really right in your head. And what qualities do you think are necessary for a successful CFO? And what does the profile of modern CFO look like? So the CFO role traditionally in the past has, you know, was focused a lot more on finance and accounting, but it has evolved to include strategic leadership, effective communication and collaboration skills and having the ability to synthesize and utilize data. So the success of the CFO in my mind is measured both in internal facing and external facing matters and you know after all you are in charge of all accounting and finance functions internally but you also now have to be an outspoken representative of the company externally while having the financial expertise and the ability to understand complex financial data and analyze trends is is key to the cfo role the modern cfo i think also is a strategic partner to the company you contribute to the overall business on a continuous basis CFOs are now key decision makers in any financial and strategic move the company makes, whether that's you know a licensing deal in the case of biotech to mergers and acquisitions or any any kind of financing efforts. And in many instances, as it is with me too, the CFO is also in charge of many other functions. In my case, I'm in charge of HR, IT, PR, and IR functions, especially smaller companies. The CFO ends up wearing multiple hats and has very broad responsibilities. So you have to have these skills to manage these various departments. And I think you also, because especially you know, speaking for biotech, it, since it's a very capital intensive industry, as a CFO, you also need to have, you need to stay on top of capital markets at all times. You need to build strong relationships with Wall Street, work with equity research analysts, and always explore potential capital markets opportunities. And it's also key to have relationships with multiple banks throughout the spectrum to help the company in its growth trajectory. Because, you know, what that means is that for every market cap of a company, there is a corresponding investment bank and an investor type. And you're going to want to move up the food chain as you're growing the company and expand your institutional shareholder base and get better institutional shareholders as you move forward as well. And when you're hiring for your own team, what qualities are important to you in general and then specifically to thrive within biotech? I look for a few things. As I mentioned before, the the drive that people have is the, I think, of utmost importance. I mean, you need to have people who are hungry to learn, who are wanting to take on more responsibility as they move forward. They obviously need to have a, a good education, but you know, that, that cultural fit of accountability is the most important thing and doing background checks on people getting references is very very important in that process as well to to get a real understanding of who this person really is obviously they need to have a a good pedigree and an education as well and, and past you know relevant experience and as a cfo how closely do you get to work with the scientific teams the short answer is that we are in complete sync. I work extremely closely with our scientific team. The 
current environment requires us to be very mindful of our cash burn and you know requires a significant amount of collaboration between the scientific team and the finance team. Not every member of the team may be aware of the financial restrictions that the company is facing. And you know, there are competing needs between different scientific programs as well. Um, so you know, we try to have a very collaborative environment throughout the company. For example, you know, we during our annual budgeting process and the, the following periodic reviews, the scientific team gets heavily involved as it's crucial for I think the finance team to have a clear and in-depth understanding of the science while we are also ensuring the needs of the scientific team are met. And I think also the involvement of the scientific team in these strategic planning sessions demonstrates that their contributions are incredibly important and, you know, people, their needs are being heard. And how do you create a culture that promotes creativity and innovation, which I'm certain is very important within biotech and also an environment in which people feel safe to try new things and fail. That's really good because it really reminds me of, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard, there's a, I think it's Reed Hastings, Netflix culture. I have really been inspired by that book and I recommend everyone to read that. It's called No Rules Rules. Failing and having that the culture of appreciating that things may not go the way you want is very important, especially in an industry like ours, because whether that be in science or, or somewhere else, it, we're going to have instances where we may not get it right 100% of the time, and that's okay. And you know, you just have to have backup plans, and you have to have contingency plans, and you have to have good communication of the situation. You know, in our case, we're a public company, so. You have to have good communication of of everything that's happening in the company um, on a timely basis to your shareholders. And I think communicating, you know, all of those things that I mentioned, that's okay for that to happen. It's it's very important in fostering that kind of creative culture. And can you share some of your experiences of equity deals, raising capital and managing investor relations and, and some of the lessons that you've learned along the way? Yeah, for sure. That has been my whole career, pretty much. You know, I, I don't have an, an, an accounting background like many of my peer CFOs, but uh, you know, the the investment banking firm that I worked at early in my career, I was part of a vastly diverse set of deals. These ranged from you know single digit equity financings to fifty million dollar raises. I raised capital using any structure you can think of under the sun, even came up with some of our own structures. We raised plain equity, preferred equity, convertible debt, and, and different kinds of debt facilities. One of the, the more memorable deals that I worked on at that firm was a private company financing we did for a tech company with proprietary technology, and they have really good market clients. We raised about twelve million dollars for the company privately, and our goal, you know, was to get the company funded, to hit some milestones, and then, you know, we would want to lead their IPO. Because we were a smaller and more of an up-and-coming bank, they decided to go with one of our larger, more established competitors for their IPO. Even though, you know, we had already lined up their investors, against all our advice, they went ahead with our competitor, and they eventually had to pull the plug on their IPO. They had a failed IPO. And that really stuck with me because I, I think it's always important for companies to consider the question, you know, do I want to work with the A team at the smaller, more specialized bank or the, the B or the C team at the larger bank? And I, in my mind, the answer is almost always the former. And, and that's when it occurred to me how important it is to have a finance leader who is able to execute these kinds of transactions swiftly. And, I talked to myself, you know, I, I've done so many of these transactions and I know what works and what doesn't work. And if I were that company CFO, I would have done things a little differently and, and realized that, you know, maybe one day I should. And here we are. At uh, 180 Life Sciences, we went through a private merger in 2019 where three companies and research programs were combined under one umbrella. It was a very complex transaction and we merged companies and we merged a company in the UK with a US company with an Israeli company. And it was a very complex transaction. And there were, while there were many factors important to the success of that merger, I found that the investor relations and getting the support of key investors we had behind the deal was crucial. In that process, I led the communications for this and, you know, with both the old and the new investors throughout the merger process. 
And I found that, you know, clear and transparent communications with those investors was vital to get their support and we were able to raise capital in connection with that merger. And, and that goes to show how important it is to get the message out there. Sounds like you've learned some really great lessons. So what advice can you offer for other CFOs out there on how to prepare for and manage during difficult economic times? First of all, I think you you know you need to have a long enough runway to weather the storm. That's that's number one. You know we're going through one of the hardest cycles right now, um, and we don't know how long it's going to last for. Make sure you know you have contingency plans in place in case you need to cut costs. You need to develop a financial model with you know multiple scenarios, and you got to stress test them. Second is keeping lines of communications open with your investors and your lenders, provide them updates on the organization's financial health and plans. In the meantime, explore you know, potential credit lines or finance, other financing options to ensure access to capital if you need it. And I find that cash flow management is key and it's, for, it's, it's in the forefront of everyone's mind. You know, you need to review and revise your budgets as you go forward, Can you review your capital expenditures as needed. And just don't wait for things to actually get worse. And, you know, as mentioned before, wearing multiple hats, I think, is very important. Most CFOs can learn the skills and take on additional roles proactively to have, you know, the IT, HR, and other functions report into them. You can also see this as an opportunity. Companies are always going to have some challenging times and the economy is always going to go through some downturns. And it's at these moments where you need skillful and resilient executives and team members. And, you know, for fellow biotech CFOs, you need to work closely with the scientific team to have a good understanding of their needs and align it with the broader business. So you need to be, you know, in full sync with your priorities and milestones. And you're no stranger to periods of high growth. So how can a CFO ensure that the finance function is agile and adaptable? Yeah, and that's very crucial for every organization that finance function remains agile and adaptable. First thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, you have to invest in robust digital infrastructure, which means, you know, modern financial reporting systems, data analytics tools, and automating the tasks that you can automate within reason. And I know, you know, the, autom- the cost of automation can also sometimes get out of control. With, well, there's so many different softwares out there, um, and implementing software is not cheap. But, you know, just focus on the pain points of the finance function and address those first and see what you can achieve in that in that way. This will help you stay ahead of the game. And there has been a real push in this area, especially after the COVID pandemic, and everyone has has been focusing on this. Secondly, going back to one of the previous points I made, fostering collaboration between finance and other departments to share insights is key. I find that having regular meetings with teams outside the finance function is very important. And, you know, similar to what I mentioned before, the, the, during the budgeting process, we involve the scientific teams in that um, every year and keep them updated at regular intervals. This transparency allows for the scientific team to have a good understanding of the company's finances. And at the same time, you know, their priorities may change. So we need to be reflecting all of those changes in the financial forecasts. And, you know, these forecasts do need to be, I think, rolling forecasts. You got updated on re- in real with real-time information and changing circumstances as you go forward. And what advice would you give to a CFO just starting out in their career? This goes back to one of the points you mentioned. You need to learn the business you're working with inside and out. And take the time to understand the industry, the general business, unique trends, customers, and in our case, the patients. And your competitors, you know, getting to know the people you're working with at your company as well um, is very important. All of these will allow you to be an outspoken representative and an advocate for the company, both inside and outside. Additionally, the adage of you are who you surround yourself with is true to your crew in your role as a CFO too. You need to form a very high performing team around you, which is only going to make your organization better and your life easier. You know, this sometimes may result in hard decisions as you may need to let some people go, but I can't stress enough how important it is to have a capable and motivated team. And in addition to that, you know, in your personal life too, I find that surrounding yourself with people who have achieved the, you know, the CFO title and other CFO, other peer CFOs 
bouncing ideas off of those communities is very, very important. And there, there are some out there that I belong to, and I find it incredibly useful. And what about a CFO who's thinking about making a move specifically into life sciences? Any advice for them? Assuming that you're a seasoned CFO, you know, you have some CFO experience already, you have very, just keep in mind, you have a very transferable uh, skill set. Even if you're coming from outside the life science industry, your expertise and financial leadership experience is very valuable. On the other hand, you have to keep in mind that this industry requires a completely different mindset. While in many industries, other industries, the product development cycles can be relatively quick. In life sciences, it takes years and years to realize ROI. You need to really focus on long-term value creation and be patient. And the other thing to focus on is getting familiar with the regulatory framework in the life sciences, which is very different than others. Developing a strong understanding of FDA regulations or the processes of other regulatory bodies is key to understanding the business you're in so that you can speak the same language as everyone else. Lastly, life sciences is a very capital intensive industry. So you need to develop really strong relationships with Wall Street um, as you're going to be constantly in capital raising mode. And last question for you, what is keeping you up at night these days as you think about the future? There's a lot there. <laughs> One of the challenges we're facing right now is, I think, related to the economic developments around the world. You know, as you know, the story in the last couple of years has been that, you know, the central banks fight against inflation and we're coming off of a high inflationary environment and which resulted in higher interest rates. This ended up hammering our valuations, valuations of innovative companies and more kind of on the speculative side of the economy, especially in biotech, have been depressed significantly. You know, many of the public companies are trading below their cash balance, which, which is crazy. I worry about how long this environment will last, what the short term and long term impact of it will be on the innovative side of the economy. And it seems like there's some light at the end of the tunnel, but the timing we we just don't know Um, and this is a problem that both tech and biotech companies are facing i think ozan thank you so much for being my guest today thank you so much megan for having me yeah i really enjoyed speaking with you and thanks for finding the time to be here with us today to share your experience and knowledge likewise thank you so much Yep, I wish you and 180 Life Sciences all the best. And to all of our listeners, please tune in next week. And until then, take care. If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personiv. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personiv can do for you by visiting personiv.com. You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Personiv. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personiv.com. Thanks for listening.